challenges and possibilities. Um, I will be introducing myself and then Murilo and then we can open to the whole group. And my name is Eliane Camargo Borges. I'm originally from Brazil where I have been working on healthcare and collaborative practices together with Murilo. Right now I live in the Netherlands and I work in international masters and I'm trying to bring those ideas of healthcare, community building Brazil into an organization development uh, field, in, uh, which is the, the field uh, I'm working right now. Um, the reason why we decided to uh, invite a uh, conversation on this topic and we want to explore more ideas uh, is because we are seeing that this world in change is really urging new ways of doing healthcare. And we notice that the traditional healthcare system is not supporting ma mo anymore the way of people are reorganizing themselves in healthcare, and especially patients the way usually they used to uh, relate to the health team and doctors in a more passive way is not happening anymore. So there is a crisis in their relationship. So we want to explore more ideas on that. And later on I can bring up more of my ideas. But the, the, the setup for this conversation is really about us co-creating new possibilities on how to develop ideas on this uh, topic. So you pass uh, the floor to Murilo. Thank you. I'm Murilo Mosqueta. I'm Brazilian, as you know. Uh, and that's where I've been working as a professor in a state university in the south of Brazil. And I work with undergrad students, psychology students. Uh, and I prepare, try to prepare them for the work in the healthcare context. I also work in the master program there. Uh, now with two students that are also working in the healthcare context, trying to use social constructionist idea uh, in thinking how they can improve health healthcare assistance in Brazil. Uh, I have a history of working with uh, gay, lesbian and transgender movement in Brazil and that's how I approach healthcare. Um, I, I was uh, leading a group uh, when a healthcare team invited me to work with them because they were not uh, being successful as they describe it, uh, working with transgender clients in the service. These clients were going to the service taking um, STD exams or picking up some condoms but they were not establishing a relationship with the healthcare team. And this team asked me to go there and see, uh, and try to think with them what was not working in that relationship that they could not go on together. So I worked with them, that was my PhD uh, thesis, and I have a little bit to share about it maybe later. Uh, but as Celiani said, what we want for this moment in, in this morning is to have a space in which we can share uh, who we are and who we are in relation to social constructionist ideas and working in the healthcare context. So what, what are your experiences in this context? What are you thinking about it, what are the challenges you are facing, and then we may try during this conversation to get a list of the resources uh, that we have been using, and maybe we can see something new here. We are very interested in getting to know what are the resources that you guys are already using. Maybe you're not even aware that you are using some constructionist resource that might be working, and here we can raise that and co-create possibilities to get an exchange. Before we start introducing uh, ourselves, I want to make sure with our virtual participants... You're getting on. Are you guys on? Kathy, are you on? I was on two minutes ago. I'm not able to get... <laughs> I do get bounced over. You're not able to... It's not lo loading the live stream. On the internet. Is it a delay? Maybe it's a delay. Maybe it's a delay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
introducing you to a cop. Can you get there? What's that? Yeah. Oh, our comment. Oh, okay. Like oh, okay. Are they in the chat room? So maybe we should ask them if they want to talk to us on the chat room or in the live stream. Uh, That's a great idea. Yeah. And then we know where they are and they can also share their ideas with us. It's hard to get Alright, I was there. It just wouldn't work. Okay. Okay. There we are. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Okay. That's all. All right. Okay. So if you go to media live stream, yeah. click on live now. It takes you to us. And I'm gonna tell them in the chat room that we are in the live stream, so they can go there. Mm -hmm. Right, Kelly? Shall we be in the live? <coughs> <laughs> okay, because they will be. Yeah, they will be here. coming live here stream. Talk, in the live stream. Yeah. So, who would like to start? Uh... So, what we, we we wanted to do is to say your name, your country, and um, where are you in relation to the healthcare contest practices and social construction. Are you familiar with that? Are you working with that? I'll start. My name is Jacqueline. I'm from Vancouver, Canada. I'm not really working in healthcare. I'm working more in education and my background is clinical and counseling. Um, but my PhD um, project that I'm working on, which is um, what they call participatory action research, is in the subject of education. Um, and uh, so I find that a little bit related to health. Mm -hmm. How can we say that, that education and health are good friends? Mm -hmm. So um, I was trying to understand how it was in this small Mexican community that the kids were not so interested in education. So I'm looking basically at the rural education and the disparity between that and urban education. And what are, uh, I particularly was looking at the scholarship program, kids and how come they're interested in learning and how do they get to be like that. That's what I'm focusing on. <clears throat> and of course, it's relational. Mm -hmm. Sure. Hello, uh, my name is Kevin Cloutier. I'm from uh, Kitchener Waterloo in uh, Ontario, Canada. I'm a director of service at a uh, children's mental health center there. And over the past uh, two years, anyway, uh, we've been in a uh, transformation from working with mental illness and mental health problems to uh, repositioning it from a position of uh, seeking wellness and healing. Um, our tagline now is um, uh, children who choose wellness uh, heal from trauma and choose well and, and uh, are resilient. So, so we're, we're looking at it from much, what are the resources that are available um, intrapsychically and relationally that we can work with, with children um, in our programs and within the community that's going to um, uh, create an alternative uh, uh, view of themselves and in their social context that they have resources and capabilities uh, in order to be well within the community. So that's where we're coming from. And it's, certainly pertinent to the conversation we're having today. Looking forward to some contributions and conversation. Uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario. Thank you. Pleasure. My, sure. Jeanette. No, no, I, I just my pleasure. Okay. My name is Jeanette Samper. I'm from Bogota, Colombia. I'm a therapist, a systemic family therapist, a university professor, basically. But in the last a couple of years in wanting to do more in, for our country. We have formed a small group of multidisciplinary professionals and we are now working with the largest hospital in Colombia and have been asked by the CEO of this hospital to um, help him or reach a dream of improving uh, the health care services, especially you know, the, the human aspect of the healthcare, 
technology, service, everybody in the hospital, you know, and, and to improve, to change the culture, and you know, to change the culture from a culture that is focused on deficit and problems and illness and what doesn't work, to create a culture of, I guess, wellness or respect, of uh, more dialogue, of, of you know, transforming the culture from within, and. My hope is to uh, acquire from all of you, uh, to bring home some ideas that will help us to continue this process and reach this dream, is to change the culture from within, and we're working with uh, groups of people from every level, in groups, you know, mixed groups, mm -hmm. um, and um, we hope that once we have, we're using appreciative inquiry, narrative practices, um, you know, of course, social constructionist ideas, and uh, to create stories of um, best practices or you know within, and eventually we hope that if there's enough stories going on and being spread, then uh, you know the, the culture will begin to change, and then eventually the the identity, because the stories that that patients will tell about how they've been treated in new, better ways yeah. will become the hospital's identity, which is the one of the goals. To stand out as you know, a hospital where uh, people are important. Beautiful. Gracias. Obrigado. <laughs> I'm Kelly Swaggart <coughs> from North Carolina in the United States, and I am a nursing leader at a very large health system that is in Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. And I'm also a PhD student at the Taos Institute, and I'm working on um, rethinking nurses' relationships with older patients and um, trying to impact how nurses interact with older patients. <clears throat> um, other work that I'm doing around this topic is um, pretty challenging, but working on a strength-based approach to nursing um, and versus a deficit-based um, model, um, and really in terms of leadership, working with a strength-based approach to leadership, nursing leadership. So, can I just, are you doing this in one hospital or in the whole system? Well, if or you in start a unit? somewhere, yeah, so where are you starting? <laughs> starting we, we do have some engaged leaders in the organization around uh, positive psychology and appreciative inquiry and, and social construction. Um, but it's a small, small group, so I'm starting where I can impact in, in the one facility, but also working with our chief diversity officer in, around the ageism piece and then with our organizational development folks on the other models. So whatever we can do, it, it, we, we like to share our ideas across the system. I'm Nora Renteria, I'm from Mexico City, and I am a professor at the University of Mexico in a, a postgraduate uh, thing in family therapy, but I also work at the hospital in a clinic of um, eating disorders, trying to put all these ideas together to work with the girls and their families. I work with a group of girls, with the families, and in individual therapy. And it has been um, a hard to, to take all these ideas in the hospital. And that's why I was interested in being here, to, to see some ideas. Because it's really hard sometimes to work with the um, psychiatric staff that they won't uh, be very open to hear all these ideas, so it's kind of um, um, hard work to do every day, you know, working with them. So I'm, I'm really glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm Jane Taylor. I'm, I live in St. Paul, Minnesota, and um, I'm an, called an improvement advisor. So. I'm an independent consultant. I was a hospital CEO for 10 years. And now I work with big not-for-profits, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and 
the National Initiative for Children's Healthcare Quality, which is for pediatrics. But we try and improve care around the world based on a topic. And our approach is evidence-based, put the evidence into, um, into place and close the gap between what is and what could be possible. So we use some of the same words, but they mean different things to us. And we mostly work in this sort of scientific method of uh, pragmatic scientific method. We're going to try, we have these ideas, we're going to try them on a small scale, learn from them, and decide what to do next. So that's sort of our approach, and I'm trying to figure out how to start uh, wedging in social construction ideas uh, to change the dialogue, make the dialogue more generative. And also sometimes we work in areas where there is no evidence. And so that seems like a good place for this work. And we're starting a new initiative on patient family-centered care. So I think there's a role I could play if I could learn enough to, to be coherent uh, about social construction. <laughs> and um, I just got back from a conference Monday where I was leading an open space and I learned that at the South Central Health Foundation in Alaska, they wanted to rehumanize health care. And so they asked their tribal member, owner, clients, customers, um, they call them customer owners, what health would look like. And they were surprised to find out that the people said it would be um, an end of domestic violence, child abuse, and neglect. So now they've created a wellness warrior program, and so they're creating wellness warriors and uh, working on these problems because they believe, because of their colonization, that this would do the most to improve health. So it's not the chronic care, same old, it's, so I'm very interested now in maybe looking at what, what are they doing, how are they doing it. They're doing it with story and they're doing it with relationships. So it's all about the convert, the re, and the providers and the care team are telling their stories and the patients or the customer owners are telling their stories and so they're trying to connect personally and out of that personal relationship, it, this is my just very uh, understanding. So I'm interested in that, mm -hmm. and um, so that's what's that's. Yeah. Sorry, I went too long. <laughs> so we're here. And I'm Diane Jacobson. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'm an epidemiologist by educational background. So I spent about 15 years in the hospital setting in various roles in um, epi epidemiology, obviously, but also in quality improvement and in risk management. And um, I'm one of the little wedges that has been influenced by Jane and her excitement and how I came to become aware of and familiar on a very small scale so far, um, social construction. I'm working full time for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in Boston. And so our roles um, overlap or interrelate. I'm what's called a director, so I direct different initiatives, as Jane described, around a content area. And one of the um, one of the areas that I'm currently working within a large health system is around improving sepsis care, care for patients with sepsis. And one of the things that I resonate with and that we really led this initiative with was a real focus on the impact on the patient and family and invited everyone at the first meeting to come with a story about a patient or family. And it was a little challenging within that organization for people to, you know, like what is this about and to be comfortable. And one of the physicians said, oh, I have some great, I have a couple of great stories. And he brought to the first meeting two letters, one from a family where care was basically great and one from a family where care was very less than ideal. And he shared very openly, and he really opened up a, a dialogue that I think was unique in their culture, because it's a system of hospitals that have been bought and brought together, not necessarily by choice over the years. So it's a very eclectic culture in any case. Um, my interest is around the patient and family. I'm a PhD student and the area that I'm also interested in is aging. 
I'm looking at a community of women in um, southern Wisconsin, of whom my mother is one of the participants, and the way that they have supported make meeting together over the last number of years, not exclusive to health care, but in that clearly is part of it as sure. they approach end of life, but the way that they have really um, come together and develop this incredible community of women that has been very, very supportive in their decision making as they have um, health crises that come up, etc. So I'm really um, at the very beginning mm -hmm. of my journey and excited about it. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. I'm getting pinged all over the place here. <laughs> 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 um, I'll go too long. Um, but especially on this question, do we have to wedge it in? You know, do we have to make this a secret somehow? And this uh, same experience happened to me that we were tippy toeing around the cage. of care and I'm not a clinician so I was new to the whole environment and the first thing that happens is this physician puts his hand on the table and he says I have a story and he, and he broke everything he told a story about the time when you know a son came and begged him to let his father die right and it just shifted the whole permission and, and our imagination about what it was going to be like to use this kind of work and what is social construction the story is social construction right? it is and so, so that was sort of my entry into um, you know, believing that this can be really valuable in a, in a clinical environment, you know, and not worry so much. I mean, they're, they're sort of hungry for it, actually, the mm -hmm. human side of all of this. What does so, it mean? My name is Ellen, I'm sorry. My name is Ellen. Hi, Ellen. Hi, Ellen. I live in San Francisco. That story happened in Houston. Um, and, uh, and so then I found um, my partner who works in collaborative care for a long time, builds collaborative environments in ICU. So that's my current, and my research then was the social construction of collaborative environment. So this ability to talk about it or be coherent about it, like I never got there. I'm still not coherent about it. But some, somehow that partnership of me sort of taking deep dives in it and his very practical on the ground being a clinician in it was a great combination and allows sort of the mix that we need to to um, have the conceptual frameworks and the concepts and have the how you take that every day in, right? Because he lives every day. It's not like you can stand in the hallway and talk about social construction all the time. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> so, so creating ways that, that it becomes a practical um, part of really reconstructing the context has been our work. So, um, it, and it, it's, it takes a lot longer than I would have thought. You know, can we have this done by the end of the week? You know, but you know, ten years later, it's still a hard conversation. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's me. Um, I'm Kathy Clark from, uh, actually I live very close to Ellen in the East Bay, San Francisco. Um, and uh, I'm a lawyer by profession. And I have a PhD from Thomas Tilburg and my, my dissertation was on collaborative law and collaborative practices at the intersection of law and medicine. Um, basically looking at medical errors and how, how our society and how healthcare responds to them and, and the legal piece of that and how to rethink and take a different approach to it, less adversarial, hopefully. Um, so that's my, that was my dissertation. And at this point I'm doing some healthcare consulting in my county, uh, in the East Bay. And one of the things we're trying to get to, which we sort of go in and out of, is co-creating health. And that is uh, looking at how health is approached in the, in the communities versus how it's approached in the traditional healthcare system. And so I found Celiani's a uh, couple of articles that she wrote about um, health work, community health workers, and you know this whole approach in Brazil. And I went, aha! And so then I connected with her, and she came to San Francisco, and it was very exciting. And I met Kelly at the Narrative Medicine Workshop at Columbia in 2011. So um, I have some connections here already, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's so, really my interest. Is it Contra Costa by any chance? Yes, it is. <laughs> well, then you have a connection with us. Yeah. <laughs> Do you really? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Let's put our heads together yeah, yeah, and get well, them going comfy. in the right direction. Really we also good. have They're two really facilitators online. Mm -hmm. um, Ray Wells is our online facilitator, and he works with International Leadership Development Program and Institutes in Brazil. 
Brazil and a new one in Colombia and he that that will start in 2014 and he uses AI and strength strength based approach and um, Arlene Cats yes. is on as well. I'm not, I don't know what her She's my advisor. Is. Oh, okay. Oh, Maybe right. she works with John Schroeder, right? Yeah. She does yeah. indeed. She's at Harvard. And oh. um, one of the articles that she wrote that you may be familiar with is Council of Elders mm -hmm. um, that describes a project that they did. Um, Hi, Arlene. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Arlene. <laughs> Council of Elders? Council of Elders. It's a very beautiful yeah. word. Yeah. And where do you get the article? No, you can ask Eileen. <laughs> you can Google it? Okay. And I can email it to you if you would whatever. like me to. I'd be happy to email it to you if you have an email. Address. I'm going to get in touch with you. Again. Okay. Please do. Because I can. Because I go to Boston. And oh, okay. Okay. So Please. you definitely should connect to Yes. Yeah, you yes. should meet Arlene too. Yeah, Arlene yes. wonderful. Well, I always wanted to meet Arlene and didn't know how I was going to be able to get in, so... <laughs> now we are in the same room, huh? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we're we're together together now. Together. We'll plan a party. Okay. We'll there you go. Okay. <laughs> um, Ray says his program focuses, his focus is only for health professions educators. And he's in Colombia? He, where are you, Ray? <laughs> because he said... He said that one will. Oh, I think he said that one starts in 2014. He's going to a new one in Colombia that will start in 2014. And we have a way of contacting Ray. There's always a way. Our program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. You yes. can follow him on the connect part Do of it. the yeah. help tower. <laughs> when you help me afterwards, yeah. <laughs> now, also, one of my students. He's in I Philadelphia. Help. I teach a program that's a year long. That, um, He's in Philadelphia. Trains people to do what I do. And there's a woman there from Brazil, and she is uh, has a website. That, I guess the Minister of Health just said safety is going to be a big uh, national attention. And so there should be a place for patient voices there, too, and family voices. But she has a website um, to help take evidence out to the field. So I just did the virtual introduction for you guys mm -hmm. to see. Nice. Because that it might be something that could really invigorate her work. Mm -hmm. Because her work is it's a, it's a very sort of static, um, here's the evidence, mm -hmm. come and get it. Mm -hmm. What, what, one of the things I'm, I'm applying to be uh, a student, a uh, PhD student, and one of the things that, that really fascinates me is this whole idea of knowledge mobilization. And there's all these little projects all over, and that, that notion of okay, let's write an article, we'll send it out, and hopefully somebody reads it, versus how do we engage healthcare communities? I love this, like South America, the States, Canada, it's fabulous. Um, how do we engage those communities and, and, and have those conversations, not only at the local level, mm -hmm. but uh, globally, mm -hmm. so, so that it's not by happenstance that we, we come together at a table in, in Taos mm -hmm. and somebody happens to be here and we go, oh great. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's, that, that's just a question that just... And just uh, listening to you, Kevin, it makes me think that our work, most of our work, when I listen to all these stories, is about how can we engage people in healthcare, how can you help them connect. And by doing that in healthcare, we kind of exercise ourselves in connecting together to give us strength to keep going with our healthcare connection. And, and all these stories makes me think uh, of ways in which we can break down with the massive healthcare system that David Copperwriter just said that by nature is such a system that starts approaching from the problems about diagnosis, about telling the other how to live, what to do, what to eat. So, and we are trying to do the other way around. Yeah. So we are talking about creating stories. We are talking about education, how education is connected with healthcare, about making meaning together. So I think those are all resources that might help us in getting this. And also research. I was really pinged again when Kelly said um, that uh, whoever it is online said only in education. And that separation between professional education in healthcare and collaborative practice is one that's really surfacing right now. And I just had a conversation with somebody about 
role of action, participatory action research in bridging that gap. And I think Taos is in a particularly good place to, you know, bring in people who are already rooted here, already, and, and do social construction is to sort of research and convene us together yeah. to, to do action that, you know, between education and practice. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing a fair amount of reading in knowledge brokering. And, and the notion that you're you're trying to engage two different worlds, two different traditions, and not to get hooked into either, but somehow co-create something that's fresh, new, through through a process of, of that engagement. And I, just when you're when you're speaking the way that you are about how do you how do you what's through is it through stories? I, I'm 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 fascinated by how to engage that education, how to engage that dialogue mm -hmm. with so many multiple players. Yeah, so I was on a call today um, with a group of, of uh, clinic, pediatric clinic practices and uh, they just got their patient survey results back, what, how do patients judge their care. Wow. And so I, I asked them what surprised you. Now I'll start asking what are you curious about. The, so what I tried to do was ask questions because they would say, well, we're really curious. We don't understand why our patients are telling us that we don't um, screen their kids. And yet they're doing all the screening. So um, it, it was an opportunity for me to jump in and, and start asking asking the questions about curiosity because dialogue, you know, like um, dialogue takes time. Mm -hmm. When you have ten minutes for a visit, I, I'm I'm worried if I go a dialogic approach, it's gonna there's not gonna be enough time in that setting. Okay. So then, how could we start using that, asking the questions to to lead to action or trying different things, consulting with uh, others, you know, other mm -hmm. family members to figure out what would be better, or what would be more useful, sorry, more useful, get the words right. <laughs> God, my world's just collided. <laughs> but I don't know if I'm building on it, but it, it's what just sparked me okay. when you said that. You know, I think you can do a lot more with 10 minutes than you imagine. I think you're right. Yeah. You don't have a lot of chitter-chatter, yeah. meaningless. Or waiting. At the beginning. And I also think that you can ask things that invite people to think about them that you can then come back later on. Right. Especially reflective questions. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm working on medical legal partnerships in Contra Costa County, which I've been talking to them about for years, and they're actually doing it. And uh, one of the things that I was suggesting, because they're all the, the providers are saying, they don't have time to ask yeah. these questions, like how you're having, do you have heat for your children? Is there lead on the walls? You know, this kind of thing. Yeah. Is to have questionnaires so that when people come in, they can fill out, you know, just the basics of do you have enough food to eat? Can you last till the end of the month? All this kind of thing. So that when they get in to see the provider, the provider can say there's an attorney on duty down the hall who can help you with X or write to your landlord or whatever. So that is really helping sort of the providers out of that anxiety of, you know, right. we're just we're just opening this conversation and we just don't have the time to keep it going. Right. So are you one of those attorneys that would likely be down the hall to be able to I would to love to be one. We're just sort of getting it going we at this point and trying to figure out how to do the training. Mm -hmm. you know? That sounds terrific. I, I don't understand the metaphor down the hall. No. Actually, you're in the co-located. Oh, co yeah, co okay. To help okay. the patients. Yeah, because it, yeah. the, the social services. The resources, right? right? They oh, see okay. you're hungry, the but they can't do anything about it. So, right? for instance, you know, mm -hmm. they, they they don't have housing. They're going to get kicked mm -hmm. out in three days. Lead. You know, they don't have heat or lead paint. The, you know, the children have chronic asthma and these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. They all they can do is see the patient in the emergency room. They have yeah. no time or resources to do anything else. So, if they have this kind of training in medical legal partnership, they can say that's an issue that a lawyer can take care of, go down the hall, wow. there's a lawyer wow. on duty. So yeah. Why not work together? And it's well, called I'm medical absolutely. legal partnership. <laughs> yes. yeah. Yeah. I mean, and other community-based organizations, right? So tooling up and reorganizing, like you said, you know, these connections, you know, that make a, a conversation likely to happen, right? I'm not going to open a conversation I can't do anything about, you know, it just... Mm -hmm. so. Arlene, Arlene has added something to the conversation. She says, look at the exchanges so far, the importance of inviting community voices and how they can shift fixed assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, she referred to particularly the topic of ageism. Mm -hmm. 
I would. Um, I heard your I, reaction as as yeah. we talked about it, and you're like, well, why not? I think it's the reaction that we're looking to really engender more broadly, mm -hmm. because we we don't need to work within these silos, these silos, and I think we haven't traditionally thought about the connections that someone's in your work is bringing to the forefront and really mm -hmm. pushing that conversation. Well, so we have assumptions about what it is. Do you know what legal? The role of legal is in healthcare, right? Which mm -hmm. doesn't get debunked if we don't mm -hmm. like the conversation. I think one of the right. silos that we forget most about is the patient family silo. Mm -hmm. And we, right. we operate with them being separate and distinct instead of. It, in in fact, I worry a little bit about the patient family center care movement because it's sort of like the feminine, the uh, gender studies in campus. You know, you get the ghetto, mm -hmm. and so I'm really interested in how do we not make this a separate thing, right? But, but an integrated thing. In the hospital where we work, we found that even the, the we worked with the heads of each service. Do you call them service? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, like pediatrics right. and da, da, da. and we did a we we worked with all the direct the chiefs right. of the services right. and you know they work in silos yes. and so we we the first thing we did is we asked each chief to stand up with the you know and to tell the other chief stand up or share with the other chiefs you know what they were really proud of of their service and what they wanted other people to know or the you know the other chiefs to know mm -hmm. and as they each got after they each shared what they wanted, they felt proud of and wanted the others to know, they began to, to, to talk about how they could close the gap, or the white spaces, or close the gap, you know, between their services so that the patient, when he is coming through the hospital, flows better because there is more communication and, and knowledge mm -hmm. of, 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 of the things that not the deficits, but the things that, you know, um, that, that, that really are important in, in each service. And some of the chiefs said, you know, I don't even know you. You know, I mean, uh, I don't even, they didn't even know each other. So um, this is one thing that we did and I think was... How did you accomplish that is the question I have. I'm, I'm just really curious on how you engaged the chiefs that had traditionally worked in very, you know, distinct well, we asked the hospital if we, you know, we want to work with people for, at every level. And so we asked uh, uh, to, to have, just meet with the chiefs for 11 sessions. And in those 11 sessions, uh, the first session was tell, the, you know, the group who you are, what you're proud of, what you would really like the other services to know. And think of only that, I mean, you know, in, in that kind of language. And they came willing? To the sessions? Yes. <laughs> well, I willingly in a hierarchical organization is you're chosen or you're told to go and they go. <laughs> but and, and Usually we, it, it's how it started, right? Yeah. And yeah. then you have There's to be guess. clever enough yeah. to really and hand them stuff, the yeah. first we meeting that they feel the need. Right? <laughs> Again, we have difficulties or they have difficulties in sometimes attending the sessions because their work is so hectic. Um, so we've had to create ways of, of um, I don't know, bypassing or, or no, not bypassing. Working around, Working around mm -hmm. so that um, if they can't come to a session, how to then mm -hmm. not lose them or how not mm -hmm. to, to not lose them or to keep them involved. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a challenge, but um, I think when people, our experience has been that when we talk the appreciative language and what you value and how you want to be known. I think it slowly begins to change uh, your attitude or your yeah? the culture. Uh, the culture eventually the culture mm -hmm. are are what we have in using trying to build uh, the narrative it, stories and share stories of success and stories of things that you're proud of. We're now thinking of working with the. Um, uh, the communication department and the human resources department, but now I'm thinking from something when somebody said of what is it the the uh, the people that you know when, when the clients or the patients do the surveys, mm -hmm. how to listen to those. I mean, how we can read the surveys 
and, and listen to them and see what we can do with them. But right now we have thought of using, of working with human resources and communication and how to begin to make known, I don't know if the word is published, but to make known these stories that people are proud of mm -hmm. so that they become a... Mm -hmm. uh, we have so if anybody has ideas, we have um, little video vignettes on our um, intranet where they go and video. People will submit stories and they'll go and videotape the stories. Mm -hmm. And it's the healthcare providers telling the stories about a patient experience. It would be even better if we had patients telling us the stories. Who can access this? Um, who connects to this? Anyone in the company can, can connect with that. And it's um, our our tagline used to be "Remarkable people, remarkable medicine," and we wanted to tell remarkable stories. Remarkable so stories. the remarkable stories were on the the home page, first thing you saw when you went there. Um, Ray has a question, and I'm not familiar with the terminology or the movement. Um, he wants to know if the if this is um, if the interprofessional care, interprofessional education movement is aligned with this conversation. Hmm. Are people familiar with those? No. Are you? We've no. had a little of this yeah. conversation because uh -uh. you were informing me on it. No, I uh, I'm asking the same question. Oh, okay. That's why I said, you know, okay. here's the interprofessional education movement, which I think you've prompted me about saying, and here's the collaborative practice movement, and they're different people. Some of them they know each other a little bit, but they're in different institutions, yes. right? And have uh, different curriculums and very, you know, I mean, everybody knows what it is, right? And, and I think it's coming together now. The National Center for Interprofessional or collaborative practice and interprofessional education is trying to do that, and I think we'll see more of this question happening. How do we and and because in general the the, the next generation knows a lot more about collaboration than the people who are on the practice floor right now, right? <laughs> and we're seeing that happen in, in simulation and and uh, you know other ways that we can get each other together. But we're doing it, I think, in uh, episodes of. Uh, uh, randomness and so on. To, we're not. We're still not organized that way, right? Mm -hmm. To uh, to have uh, interprofessional. Um, somebody help me with language here, you know. But uh, I, I call it practicing the future. You know, mm -hmm. together. Oh, that's nice. Right? I like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I have a, a a question, a wonder, based on something Ken said. They were talking about how Ken sort of s brought people together at the first few conferences. Um, so what would happen or what might happen differently if next year one of us could reach out and bring someone from this uh, interprofessional education. education group, mm -hmm. invite, does anybody know someone there yeah, that we could Brands bring? Were, I mean, yeah, we know lots of people. Maybe yeah. we could bring some folks next year and what would happen if they were at the table with us? Yeah. I don't even know what interprofessional education it, it, it is, means, sorry. It, it means, um, well, it, there's probably a hundred different ways to talk about what it means, but the desire is you have nursing, nursing school, right? That schedule. You have pharmacies, you have you know MDs of all kinds. You know the track goes from here. You know specialists, and you have uh, physical therapists, and you have you know you have a lot of people that are taking care. All the providers are taking care. Yeah. Those professions don't get trained together, mm -hmm. and then we call a code. And we expect all of a sudden they're going to work together, <laughs> or they're in the OR. We expect all of a sudden they're going to work together, right? Well, or we say let's do collaborative practice or just have meetings and you know like but they don't they don't grow up together. That's right. And they don't have any you know a lot of their assumptions about what they're doing is different. Right? So interprofessional education was okay. this up. Oh, and sometimes it looks like team training. They mm -hmm. think you know if we bring it and you see my face about it, right? It, it, it looks like team training. And they do, you know, the team training in the curriculum at the individual competency level. I'm gonna train you mm -hmm. to do team training. And then separately over here in your curriculum I'm gonna train you. And then when you meet you'll know how to do it, right? But we can go even go beyond that because I have seen some team building education in which we discuss together in which moment the psychologist should enter yeah. into the intervention. Right. Now is the doctor's time and now is the pharmacist right. and then collaborative practices right. might not be involved in this interprofessional. And so what we education. find is that this conversation is happening on the floor in the hospital. People who care about it are coming to this place. Let's share responsibility about the care plan in the moment at the bedside and so on, right? I mean, Chica, and, and sorry. But but how, but how does that look like in interprofessional education? How do you prepare people to participate like that? Because that's not their and experience are, within sure for their internships. Right? Where is this and happening? There are pockets of this kind of you know like law school and medical school classes together. Where they're 
learning not to be so distrustful of each other. And, and, mm -hmm. and in my context, as a community mental health center for children and youth, we got not only interni internal multidisciplinary teams that we're trying to figure out how to work together, we're also trying to learn to work together with the education system, mm -hmm. we're trying to work together with the medical system, the police, the Children's yeah. Aid Society, Child Welfare, yeah. and it's like, it's it's a muddle. It's so many worlds, <laughs> it's so many worlds, it's so many. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One example in response to your question that I was going to call out is the some organizations, some hospitals, um, are engaged in multidisciplinary rounds, which means right. different things to different right. people. And even that concept is, I'm working on an antimicrobial stewardship initiative right now, and multidisciplinary rounds in some of those hospitals means that individually they each, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't mean they have, have the together. conversation like together. <laughs> So even the term, although people say, oh yes, we have multidisciplinary rounds, the hospital does it, and then they call the pharmacist versus how do we um, encourage people to do that within the process of care at the bedside so all of the disciplines are there and in the conversation. You know, I could, it, it's one of the things I notice whenever I've had any interactions with hospitals and being a, having a social work background, I always longed for more um, nursing education information and I always thought it would be great if we started to bridge mm -hmm. the education between professions. Yeah. Yeah. So for instance, yeah. uh, I could see social work and nursing make mm -hmm. great bridges. Oh. Right. Um, mm -hmm. huge. So, you know, I have had many times people come to me and talk about what I would call medical concerns that I don't really but understand. I, you know, I'm know. thinking, oh. I'm sorry, no. go ahead, no. Jane. No, no. I'm thinking, since we're working with the mixed groups mm -hmm. of, of people right now, that we could uh, ask a question or bring up a topic of, you know, because we have administrators, we have nurses, we have doctors, we have, you know, people from... Um, how, uh, because you're saying, you know, people, we each are get our training and then we're expected to work together. Yeah. And maybe in these groups one of the topics could be to share, you know, what are, how can we co collaborate with each other? What are our different or, needs? Or and even better that one of the AI questions is, tell us about a time when right. you experienced the team coming together for a positive patient outcome. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. Mm -hmm. We did it, I know you were going to say, no, no. Um, Can we did a world now? cafe, um, and we struggled. What is the question to be asked for the world cafe? And we brought nursing, and um, we we focused on support departments instead of clinical departments. Nursing with support departments because everything grinds to a halt if the support departments aren't supporting patient care. So. The struggle we had was, what question do we bring this group together with? What's the most provocative question we can ask? Mm. We spent more time coming up with the question yeah. <laughs> than coming up with the, the yeah. meeting. You know, once once you got the right question, then everything kind of would you kind of came together. Would you be so kind as to briefly restate the question you just posed? Mm -hmm. um, Think the about question I asked. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, yes. yes. Think, tell us about a time or talk about a time when the team came together and worked effectively to um, achieve a, a wonderful patient outcome. I Some think more that you said something like that you felt you were working like a team. Was it something like that? Yeah, I, I think how you say it has yeah. to work for your language. Yeah. And for, yeah. But, but it really is tell us about a time when the team came together and everything was just amazing for that patient and that family. Right. And there are those stories that get people... <laughs> there are, and we know and wonderful those stories. stories are alive. And when they see each other say them, and I heard this, we have to go see it, right? Because in, in, to, to say, because as you were talking about storytelling earlier, I have a friend in mental illness who, who has story listening. And, and focuses on not as much the storytelling and publishing and putting in the video, but also the processing of the listening to that story and what struck each other about it. So they watch these stories together, you know, tell the stories together, and then the focus is on discussing what they heard, you know. Getting better. Yeah. So that, that second part, which is so I just wanted to add, uh, I thought that I, I was feeling that a conversation um, was really in this level of working with teams and training. And then I thought that uh, what we were talking about is how uh, 
what are the challenges of having different people working together as a team is not very different from the challenge of working with the client directly because I, I feel that that's the same idea of the specialist, the knower, the one who knows yeah. best about something and if we change the culture of how we work together as a team, we also can get the resources to see the client as a specialist and see the client as part of this team as, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were talking about who's the expert right now. Mm -hmm. You know, in the collaborative rounds, that's one thing we're very deliberate about is naming the moment when the patient and the family are the expert. They're the only ones that really understand. You know, so these, mm -hmm. these parts of things in the care plan, right? Mm -hmm. So naming that um, as a way of distributing the power, a lot of the shit. Yeah. And also makes me think about our uh, Brazilian experience. I don't know if Marilu wants to add on that, but you have read some of my papers where in Brazil they just um, um, set up this way of working uh, what they call family health care program. So every thousand families they have to have a health care within the community and they have a team over there. And it's a challenge because all this education is very much segmented but, and yeah. then they put the team together to work and how do you make this happen? But once you start working with the community that they they can, uh, they should have a more a broader approach, not taking uh, health as the opposite of illness, but looking at the community in different ways. And then all these issues start to come up that they cannot just solve by be solved by the doctor, or cannot be solved by the psychologist. And all of a sudden, they have this urge to come together and start to find resource. And that's where we have uh, encountered a rich place to research about because then. They are open to learn because they feel like we need something else. And there's so much there's so much trust in when you bring community health workers who are actually part of that community, mm -hmm. asking the questions mm -hmm. and having the conversation. The, the thing that really struck me uh, also about this conversation and and about um, uh, Mary's presentation this morning about the, the privileged language of, of different community. Mm -hmm. And so you take you you take your acad academic research. Uh, journal that is not accessible, mm -hmm. and and having the conversation with you know when when the, the client is the hero of their own story or the patient is the hero of their own story and you got this academician writing this mm -hmm. stuff with all these stats and you know like bringing those stories together so that they ha they share a meaning. Mm -hmm rather than talking to totally different audiences mm -hmm. to create that team. In a building into that, I, I have here some papers that I published with um, friend and colleague, and the interesting thing about it is I am publishing within the academic tradition, and I and her, somehow we use a personal story as a client of the healthcare system. Beautiful. To think about and, and to try to identify what are the constructionist resources for working in this context, because we are using our voices as clients. So, I just want to say, I know you're trying to jump <clears throat> in too, but no, you I, I want to say something about that if the team highly functions and they're curious and just sharing a language, and then it would walk over to the family and the patient. I have another point of view. And it's based on a five-year project I did in Minnesota where the physician, the providers and the nurse worked to develop, to reduce the hierarchy between the family and the provider. And now you're the expert in your family, you're the expert about your child, and now we're going to co-create care. And they really did this. Then, and it's the only time I've seen it, walk to the team. Now, then everything changed with the team because now I know how to have a different kind of relationship. Because before I've always been the boss, the, you know, in the hierarchy. But it was through the families taught the providers how to be other. And then the care team could do it. And because a lot of times the, well, we will look at our navel and improve our own little team, but it doesn't move, it doesn't, mm -hmm. I mean, so we have a nice team, so it's not sustainable. Yeah, exactly. So I was thinking of this design thing that, um, David Cooper writer said, and this is a little bit of a futuristic plan, but imagine if we designed hospitals in such a way as that we didn't have different departments that were separate. <laughs> they actually, the departments were together. So that people would have to talk with each other, would have to engage with each other, 
and so I, I think about how we've created these, you know, these hospitals, these centers where we've continued to create this isolation mm -hmm. and how we need to redesign things somehow so that there has to be interaction. Yeah. There is some work been, that has been done on a 10-bed hospital <coughs> concept, which is, which is mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Um, where you're responsible for the care and everything that's involved in those the, for those ten beds instead of, but that's yeah. that's fairly new. Yeah. And it's it's actually an artifact of the accounting system yeah. that there are departments. <laughs> and really? so the, yeah, and so the last hospital where I was CEO, right before I got fired, we were playing with this idea of. We're not departments, <laughs> we're compartments. Compartments. And, or how could we come together and, and, and then, you know, like, even at Park Nicolette, they said budgets are a waste of time. They add value to no one, so they just got rid of budgets, oh which is like a step to get away from <laughs> it. Wow. So, um, yeah, it's pretty shocking. But there are some serious <laughs> conversation in this group for the yeah. next day and a half. Because yes. I think we're going to have to yeah. 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 Do we have to change what? tables? What was that, Diane? I would like to just continue this have... conversation. Do we? And how can we do uh, that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we can be creative and we can do it virtually. Can we pass paper around so we know who we are? Yeah. 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 Volunteers. So, and uh, you said this earlier. We, I just have to tell you in, in November we're trying to do this. And I think we tried it once before. Tower sort of. Gathering people together who care about this. Yeah. And it's hard. And and so this question I think is a valid one. How do we stay together? We? But, but I just encourage us to try and try again. And it'll show up differently in different conferences and between conferences and whatever we can yeah. do together. Um, I, I do think Taos is a wonderful yeah. convener for us. Mm -hmm. you know, I have so never been to a, co a conference where there are so many people from so many fields. Yeah. So many what? Yeah. Yeah. Fields. Yeah. So many Ray fields. has put some resources on the resource page about this topic of interprofessional. Oh, great. Great. So, oh, great. Great. Yeah. Continue fabulous. Yeah, and yeah. we keep online the conversation. Right? I we was, have these discussions. I was actually suggesting rather um, oh. facetiously that we all just take stay. ourselves into a room and <laughs> stay in the <laughs> Right now? I know. Like I said, I, I was kidding. Kidding. So but I want to bridge on that because actually I have good news. <laughs> the master I work in the Netherlands, it's called Imagineering. Yeah. It's a it's a, a master that works with uh, business and social innovation from the experience perspective. And we use design thinking mm -hmm. to imagine and create something that doesn't work yet. And through our ideas, technology, we make it happen. And next year, we are starting a project in healthcare. So we're going to be working with some healthcare organizations that they came to us to get help. And we will design with them new ways of doing healthcare. So I'd love to have your help in oh. thinking about how could we do that. Fabulous. They Fabulous. They are all from yeah. the Netherlands, yeah. Wow. Kelly, were you going to say something else because you said there were resources or were they hit Ray's resources? Ray said, that's all. Ray said he was posting some things. He also wants to have the list of the table participants. I think there is so. one with Thank you very much, oh, guys. You. And we keep the conversation on yeah. online and we might need, I don't know, it's lunchtime. It's interesting we went to the institution instead of the people part, right? We, we just immediately got into it. You guys have to read this paper. Oh, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh oh, this paper must have come undone. There is one with oh, the fake one and one oh, wow. with the oh, fake no, one. Oh, there's two. No, there's more. Oh, that's it. Oh, these are unstable. Yeah.